There we go. So Acts chapter 6, it should be on the screen as well. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip. Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of, Jer- of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Sicilia and Asia. These men began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against his wisdom or the spirit by whom he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we have heard Stephen speak words of blasphemy against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, this fellow never stops speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Welcome, Josh. Thank you, Luke. I did get you with some names as well, which you made me pronounce uh, when I read the Bible. Awesome. Hello, everyone. My name is Josh, and it is a pleasure to be with you tonight. I regularly attend this service, usually. If you haven't seen me, it's probably because I get here late and leave early, um, uh, along with a lot of us. So I'm glad that you can be here uh, tonight, and I'm glad to be able to share the Word of God uh, tonight together. So, as Luke said, over the past few weeks, I, along with my preaching partners, Pip and Ben, have had the privilege of attending the Hills Baptist Young Guns program, uh, in which it's all summing up to produce a 10-minute sermon and bring it to you tonight. Today, we'll be continuing the Hearts of Blaze series on Acts that some of our Hills campuses have been focusing over the past few months, as we saw in the reading. And I'll be focusing my sermon on Acts 6, and these guys will be covering chapter 7. Before I get us started today, I ask that you will join me in prayer. Lord, I just pray that the words that I speak tonight are not from me, but from you. May the words of my mouth and the ministry of our hearts combined be acceptable in your sight. That you, by the Holy Spirit, may lead us into all truth and understanding. Amen. Excellent. To begin, I want to ask you a question. Are you living a spirit-filled life? Maybe your answer to that question is, what does that even mean to live a spirit-filled life? Maybe you know that the spirit is living within you, but you're unsure how to live a spirit-filled life. Maybe you've realized that you haven't been living a spirit-filled life that you've been resisting the Spirit and His ways, and you want to be filled by the Spirit again. I know that I have fit into this third bucket and have been struggling to live a Spirit-filled life and make that a priority in recent times. However, as we read from this passage today, Acts 6 and 7, it recalls the life and ministry of a man named Stephen who is mentioned as being full of the Spirit, full of faith, full of God's grace and power. And I believe that God wants us to learn from the way Stephen lived by the Spirit. So before we do jump in and and tackle that Acts 6, let's have a quick recap of what's happened in Acts so far. 
So Acts 1 to 5 describes the history of the early church after Jesus' resurrection, highlighted by the promise and the coming of the Holy Spirit. By the power of the Spirit, the disciples courageously preached the Word of God and performed signs and miracles to the people, which led to the rapid increase to the number of Christian believers. We also read how the disciples began began to face opposition and persecution from the religious leaders of that time. It's at this time that we arrive at our passage for today. If you do have a Bible in your hand or on your phone, I really encourage you to get it out. The words will be on the screen, but I will be referring to verses throughout. So keep that on your tabs. Now, for all you note takers out there, I have a very exciting proposition for you. I have a three-point sermon that has alliteration in the, in the points. Yeah, come on. Let's get an amen for that. Come on. So in this passage of Scripture, we can see that Stephen stands out in the community because of the way that he lives his life. He serves faithfully by the power of the Spirit, and he speaks with great wisdom and power as the Spirit gave him. So my first point, he stands out in the community. If we have a look at Acts 6 verse 3, it mentions the heart behind selecting the seven men. In the NIV translation, which is what we read, it reads, Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. The New King James Version puts it as seven men of good reputation who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. Good reputation. I wonder if... When we look at this phrase of good reputation, we think of someone famous. We think of someone who's out the front and is really known. However, this phrase of good reputation means so much more than that. It refers to people in the community whose lives exemplify that they are full of the spirit and full of wisdom as proof of their authenticity. Wow, hello. They didn't just get their names picked out of a hat. They were selected. They stood out from their community because of their proven desire to rely on the Spirit rather than serve out of their own strength. I read an article by uh, a actor, uh, an actor, wow, uh, a pastor in America who has a very complicated name, and I'm just going to leave that out, but he aptly describes what it means to be full of the Spirit. He quotes, full, being full of the Spirit is the most indispensable requirement of a Christian leader. Since people who are full of the Spirit are people whom the Spirit can lead and work through, this means people who have God's heart and concern for others, people who display the fruit of the Spirit. As I said before, a person may have good reputation, but is it such that their work is clearly the manifestation and work of the Spirit of God? God only wants those controlled by His Spirit to be in places of leadership and responsibility because only those people are within hearing distance of His voice. Only those people will have the capacity to care for others with the heart of God. I think this description adds a whole lot of weight to Stephen being described as full of the Spirit and gives us a glimpse as to why it is the most indispensable requirement, not only for leaders, but for us as individuals. So, as we see, Stephen stands out in his local community. Now, my second point. He serves faithfully by the power of the Spirit. Remember that he was initially chosen to settle a dispute in distributing food among the church. The Hellenistic, which is the Greek-speaking Jews, complained against the Hebraic Jews because the widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Now, from our 21st century perspective, the act of serving tables may seem like the job for someone of a lowly status, a waiter at a restaurant, as an example. However, the New Bible Commentary explains that the task of serving tables was usually a job reserved for the head of the household. 
Think, Jesus served the Last Supper to his disciples. Thus, distributing food, which may seem like to us is a lowly or not as important, it involved serving and listening to the Spirit with wisdom. So, we can see that Stephen serves faithfully by the power of the Spirit. Finally, my third point. He speaks with great wisdom and power. In the second half of chapter 6, beginning at verse 8, we see that Stephen was, we saw that Stephen was performing great signs and wonders among the people until opposition arose from the synagogue of the freedmen who began to argue with Stephen. But then in Acts 6 verse 10, we read, but they could not stand up against the wisdom that the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Now, the Greek word here, and Chip did correct me this morning, is sophia. Is that right? Close enough. Uh, which includes two things. Not only the wisdom of the word and the Bible truth, which is number one, but also two, the wise use and the application of the truth to one's life. It's likely that the members of the synagogue knew the word, but Stephen spoke with wisdom and power. He could apply it, and they could not deny that. We hear more of Stephen's speech full of wisdom in chapter 7, which these guys will be bringing forward to us later on. So we can see that Stephen speaks with great wisdom and power. We can see that Stephen stands out in his community. He serves and he speaks by the Spirit. Now, back to the question, are you living a spirit-filled life? Or maybe another question, do you want to live a spirit-filled life? You can, because Jesus has sent his Holy Spirit to be with us. The Spirit that gives Stephen the ability to stand out in his community, to effectively serve in the church, in both serving and teaching roles, and to speak with such wisdom and power is the same spirit that lives within us as believers of Christ. As I wrap up, I just want to ask a few takeaway questions. Firstly, what are the areas that the spirit is shaping you to stand out? Maybe for you, that is standing out in your workplace or at uni, maybe at a sporting or recreation club, or maybe it's to your friends and family, those people closest to you. Secondly, how is the Spirit equipping you to serve? Maybe that means signing up at church wherever you go, if that's here or somewhere else. We'd love to have you on team. (laughs) Maybe it's participating to serve a need in the community. Finally, are you being called to speak God's truth? I'm sure that there are some people in your life that really need to hear the word of Jesus in their life. And I encourage you to lean into that. In any case, I encourage you to all lean into the ways that Stephen lived by the Spirit. I encourage you to stand out in your community to serve faithfully, and to read the Word of God so that you can speak the gospel with wisdom and power. So to close, I'm going to quickly read the end of Acts 6 again. So they stirred up the people, uh, sorry, from verse 12. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified. This fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Pip, come on up. Hello. Okay. Hey, my name is Pip. 
I've got three older brothers, two parents, and two housemates aside from the parents. So technically four. And I'm currently studying visual art, which is mostly fun and a bit of work. Um, I've just started second year, and one thing I've noticed is how no one actually assumes that you can study on this level, like, forever. Like, we only have holidays or uni break to catch up in all the work we fell behind in. Sure, we can push through for a few years, though God is definitely helping me. But to do this indefinitely, no way. <laughs> and I'm doing art, not like science or anything. And I think we don't want faith to be like university. We want, or God, rather, God wants and has already designed this faith journey with him to be sustainable. I'm not talking about cutting back in areas to hopefully just get a pass in the grand scheme of things. But I guess realising that we are in this for the long run. Because life changing is a continual journey, not just a quick once-off conversion. It's not been there, done that, but instead it changes everything from that point forward. Like all journeys though, it requires something of us. It's not going to all be smooth sailing, but it is going to be worth it. So, my passage is Acts 7, 1 to 53, which I won't read the whole thing off. <laughs> um, if Josh's catchphrase was, are you living a spirit-filled life? Then mine would be, it's through grace we run. Re- oh gosh. It is, through ra- <laughs> it is through grace that we run the race. Thank you. <laughs> We've had the background of Stephen, who he was, and then these accusations against him. And then there are over 50 verses of Stephen's speech to the Sanhedrin, which are the Jewish court. I'll just give you a quick summary of what he says. So Stephen is essentially giving them an overview, overview of the scriptures, of God's covenant relationship with his people and his guiding hand in the Jewish nation's history. I think it's an interesting and important side note that Stephen is not trying to defend himself here, but he only focuses on God. Um, We find in Stephen's speech a reminder, an encouragement, and a warning. We are reminded to see the big picture, all that God has done for us, encouraged to keep journeying with God so that we may finish the race. And we are warned not to be like the religious leaders who trusted in their own works. Scholars have split, split Stephen's speech into five sections. We've got Abraham's calling, the patriarchs of Egypt, the life of Moses, Moses and Israel in the wilderness, and the tabernacle of testimony. The speech then kind of comes to a head in verses 51 to 53, and it changes tone completely. It becomes a rebuke of the Sanhedrin. Stephen references the righteous one, which is Jesus the Messiah, how they killed him and and ignored the Holy Spirit. So firstly, we have the reminder. In this recollection of their history, Stephen speaks perhaps subtly to the accusations against him. Throughout the whole summary, Stephen reminds the Sanhedrin, and us too, that God's dwelling place was never a physical place, but has instead always been among his people. And because of Jesus, it is now in his people instead. The end of the passage, verses 49 to 50, come from Isaiah. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things? I think it's kind of funny that while we can build a lot of things, the thing that God chose as his dwelling place is us. We can't make ourselves. And I realised that as I was writing this, that like everything comes back to God. It's only through his grace that we can be close to him. Only through him do we exist at all. And so while Stephen's summary of history reminds us of what God has done, It also points us to the present, where despite our constant shortcomings, God is still with us and he is still working. Um, In this passage, we also see an encouragement. In Stephen, we see a picture of someone who lives full of the spirit and runs the race to the end, even to death. We see Stephen not as someone to be idolised, but as someone who's just one of those people who are such clear reflections of Christ. There are people here today People in this congregation who, like Stephen, are running the race with determination and focus. They have followed and trusted God through thick and thin, through the ups and downs, through the years. You can probably think of someone. Maybe when you see them, you see Christ in them. After all, the Holy Spirit is living in us. And so Stephen and these godly, Holy Spirit-filled people are only inspirational because like them, we all aspire to be more like Christ. But it is hard to run the race, to walk this journey until the end. It's only, it's hard to feel on fire and overcome by the goodness of God every day. 
perhaps over time our journeys become reminiscent of the religious leaders and we lose sight of the power and presence of God. It can be hard to see God working, though when we look back over the Bible like Stephen did, we can see so clearly how God has been constantly faithful. Over time, perhaps we stray away from the, thought, away from the point, forgetting that Christ is at the centre, only Christ that saves us. It's only Christ. Stephen's summary shows the people listening the big picture. We see God's faithfulness despite our unfaithfulness. It can never be through works or anything else, but only through God. God's work are we saved. And that is the biggest encouragement of all, that Jesus has already walked this journey before us. The Holy Spirit is near and he is full of grace. And finally, we are given a warning. In verses 51 to 53, we see Stephen's speech reach its climax, turning from summary of history to rebuke. You stiff, this is reading from verse 51, 53. You stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors, ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through angels but have not obeyed it. For the religious leaders, their trust was in the religion, in the things they did and ultimately in themselves. But this journey with God, Christ, is one of grace. It's so important that we never forget that because when we forget it's only because of Jesus, we make it about ourselves or something that we do and our trust is in those things instead. So where is your trust? What is at the heart of your faith? Is it God or is it something else? It's only through grace that we run the race. It is our trust in God and his work, not ours, that sustains us to the end. Our trust in him is enough. Like Josh said, Stephen served, spoke and stood out. And these are things that we are also called to. But also, like Josh said, it's only through the spirit. With Jesus and God at the centre, these things then flow. So the warning is this. When we do these things in our own strength, we make it about ourselves and not about God at all. So, unlike a university degree, we're called to be on the faith journey for the long run. So, how is this faith sustainable? How can we run it to the end? It's only through Jesus, the Holy Spirit, God, and only through his grace. Only because God has made a way, only because God has made the way. Walking with God is about knowing him, about letting him know us, about making him known. And this is where we see the importance of prayer, reading the Bible, and actually really delving into it, worship in its many forms, and meeting with the body of Christ. And that's just one more practical thing, something that has helped me um, to keep on track and to see the big picture. I call it my toolkit, a list of truths about God. For example, this could be a summary of the Bible, as if I was explaining it to someone who didn't know God. I haven't done that yet, probably should. Um, Perhaps you could write down in as little words as possible the key points of God's journey with humanity or maybe just recording how God has worked in your life over time. So this unusual passage that recollects history, kind of a story within a story, has given us several things. The reminder, the encouragement and the warning. It reminds us to see the big picture, to see God's continual workings despite our shortcomings encourages us to keep journeying with God, to live in the spirit, to draw ever closer to him so that we may finish the race just like Stephen did. And it warns us to not be like the religious leaders who trusted in their own works because it is through grace we run the race. Hi, everyone. How's it going? Um, Hi. (laughs) Hi. You stole my line. I'm Ben, for those who don't know me. Um, and I'm going to be summarising uh, Pip and Josh's points and then also discussing Stephen's stoning as well. Um, <clears throat> and we can unpack what we're going to learn from that in line with what these guys have already said. Uh, so I'm going to begin with the account of the final part of Stephen's speech, which Pip's just covered for us. I'm going to reiterate that. And then his death as well. So this comes from Acts 7, 51 through to 59, if you want to follow along. Stephen said, You stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? 
They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him, you who have received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears and, yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Having read that, uh, we're going to dive in with a bit more detail now and unpack what's going on in this passage from Stephen's rebuke of the Sanhedrin through to his death. More importantly, we're going to look at Stephen's heart behind everything he says and does in this account. In this passage, we again see Stephen refuses to back down from what he believes. Even when he's brought before a court and condemned, knowing fully well that his life is on the line, he still holds steadfast to the gifts that God has given him. He even goes so far as to rebuke and perhaps even insult um, the, the members of the Sanhedrin, the most influential political and religious figures in the area. Stephen compares them directly to the ancient Israelites, always turning away from God's calling and resisting the Holy Spirit. Stephen finishes his rebuke as he receives a vision from God of Jesus standing at the right hand of God. This book ends the rebuke by, after having pointed out all that they'd failed in, directing their attention back to Jesus as the one who covered their failings anyway. Even as he is accused, Stephen still maintains his heart for others and for spreading God or Jesus' good news with those who need it. Now, this sends the members of the Sanhedrin into a rage and with gnashing of teeth, they drag him out to kill him. So this phrase, gnashing of teeth, conveys a great disrespect and anger. The Sanhedrin in this story is acting as a courtroom, as I think Pip mentioned already. The synagogue of the freedmen, who initially took issue with Stephen's preaching in the temple, have had him brought before this court to be judged. <clears throat> the Sanhedrin's reaction is not what I would expect from a just court of law. And in this, their own flaws and biases are highlighted. Stephen calls them out and they respond with anger and violence. Throughout the whole time he stood before the Sanhedrin, Stephen does not defend himself when he so easily could. I know that my natural instinct would be just to explain away how I wasn't in the wrong. Um, Stephen knows that the men who brought him in were trying to have him killed simply because they disagreed with him. And he also knew that the Sanhedrin had fundamentally different views about the law and that they had not yet accepted the new covenant that Jesus had made with humanity. So, rather than focusing on his own welfare, he turns his attention to them. And rather than defend himself or his understanding of God's law, he tries to show them a better way. Even in the face of defamation and death, Stephen is still the man of integrity that he was originally known as. In Stephen's eyes, this is just another opportunity to share the gospel. Even as he's stoned to death, Stephen maintains his complete trust in God and focus on the spiritual well-being of others, even those who wish to kill him. It's easy to draw parallels between the death of Stephen and that of Jesus, and I don't think it's a coincidence that Luke included those similarities in his account. Stephen is portrayed as very Christ-like throughout this entire narrative. So he's described as full of wisdom, full of faith, full of God's grace and power, a man who performed great wonders and signs and a man whose face shines like an angel. And while Stephen may be starting to sound like your perfect man, those traits didn't come directly from him. I don't know, have your friends ever introduced you to some of their friends or their family? And a lot of things start to make sense about them. <laughs> you can begin to trace back uh, 
a whole bunch of quirky expressions and mannerisms uh, and understand where they got that from. We become this walking catalog of borrowed jokes and skits, perhaps because they brought us joy and we want to spread that joy with the people around us. We impersonate and fill ourselves with little pieces of those that we admire. Stephen is described as being filled with the Holy Spirit. Luke reiterates this six times throughout the story, either explicitly or implicitly, and it's clearly something that he thought was important to mention. The traits that we see Stephen demonstrating during this chapter are not from him. They are fruits of the Holy Spirit within him. Stephen's story is not about us trying to be more like Stephen. It's about Stephen just striving to be more like Jesus. Anything, we good, anything good that we see in Stephen is Jesus reflected in him. And I think that's what Luke is trying to show us through these two chapters. Across chapters 6 and 7 of Acts, the two churches are presented, which are kind of locked in battle with, another, with one another. Rather. Firstly, we see the early church with its sights set on ministering to those who are yet to hear God's good word. They have a strong focus on outreach, but also recognise the importance of supporting and equipping the people who are already involved in their community. They support their members in their giftings and are considerate of what the Holy Spirit is trying to do through them. The second church that's presented is the synagogue of the freedmen and the members of the Sanhedrin. They are rooted in the past and maintaining or, and focus on maintaining God's old, old covenant before all else. Because of this, they fail to see the work God is doing around them in the present. They have become hard of heart and cannot recognise God's spirit at work. So, who will we be like? Will we be like the members of the Sanhedrin and the synagogue, hard of heart and refusing to see the signs of God working around us? Or... Will we reflect the early church's sensitivity to the Holy Spirit and trust and reliance on God? These two chapters are not just a snapshot of the life of the first Christian martyr, but they're a demonstration of a church and believers who were focused on Jesus and sensitive to his spirit. Let me close in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for your gift of the Holy Spirit. And that through that gift, we can improve the lives of those around us with the fruits of the Spirit. Thank you for Jesus, a man we can all look to as a perfect example. And for Stephen, who followed that example even to death. May you continue to soften our hearts and help us to see any persecution or challenge as an opportunity, as Stephen and the early church did. Amen. 